Why is the one to be seen being a wolf is way better? I'll show you. Hey everyone, how's it going? Covey here with another video, and today I'm going to be talking about an animated film I watched recently and absolutely loved, Cartoon Saloon's Wolfwalkers. I cannot recommend this film enough, and since this video is going to contain spoilers, I suggest that you go watch it over on Apple TV Plus and come back here once you've experienced it for yourself. It's a truly magical film with a clear boatload of love and passion behind it. Between the breathtaking storybook art style, the beautiful rustic score, and the absolutely adorable and lovable characters, I guarantee you'll find so many things to enjoy about this movie. One of the many things I love so much about this movie is not only how many themes it covers, environmentalism and eco-terrorism, militarism and authoritarianism, family and friendship, the sheer power of being a heckin' puppo, just to name a few, but also how intricately woven together these themes present themselves within this story. While writing the script, unpacking the story has been similar to unraveling a rope, following each thread and the ways they intertwine with each other to form a whole cohesive story. To be honest, it was actually a bit tricky, and you might notice me say stuff like, we'll get back to that later, or just a quick tangent. So when I do, we'll put a pin on the big board over here and refer back to it. You can see the big board. Given the chance, I could talk about this movie for hours, but in this video, I'd like to highlight just some of the themes that resonated with me the most, particularly as a trans, non-binary person, and to delve into how Wolfwalkers explores the themes of queer identity, gender expectations, and their roles in colonialism. After watching this movie once, the queer allegory jumped out at me plain as day, especially since I saw so much of my own journey as a trans person reflected in the arcs of these characters. I wondered if anyone else had a similar interpretation, and I found this article from Den of Geek, where writer Kevin Johnson gives his reading on some of the moments in the film that could be read through a queer lens. I'm going to link the article in the description, and you should read the whole thing, since there are some really compelling interpretations that I hadn't considered. Although, as I was reading this article, I couldn't help but think that there was some stuff that was missing as well, some moments in the story that really stood out to me. And then, this bit caught my attention. There is, perhaps, a much more thorough trans reading here that could be sussed out, to which a trans writer is much better equipped to explore. So to that, I say, I accept your challenge, Kevin Johnson, and I'm happy to present my queer analysis of Wolfwalkers. Some might say that this film is about colonialism and not about gender or queerness, and to that I would say it is absolutely about both. Colonialism as a theme is more of an umbrella that encompasses several different thematic motifs presented in this film. In fact, these themes work interwoven with each other and thereby enhance each other. Set in 1650 Kilkenny, the story takes place during the reconquering of Ireland by the English Parliament. And if you know anything about history, then you know that English imperialism is pretty much all bad news. For many parliamentarians, these conquests were also religiously motivated, with much of these armies being Puritan. The film presents a commentary on these crusades, depicted as an imperialist pursuit of power and control. The evils of colonialism are embodied in the story's villain, the Lord Protector, aka the real-life English general Oliver Cromwell. I won't get too off track in trying to explain the real-world history, but if you're interested in learning more, I'll link to some interesting readings down in the description below. But for the sake of understanding this film, essentially what we need to know is that religious imposition and supposedly holy crusades are often used as justifications for capitalistic and imperialistic pursuits. I will lead cannons to the den of these beasts and send them all to hell. No! We shall prevail. It is the Lord's will. And a major part of this Puritan oppression includes the obtrusion of strict gender roles, as we also see depicted in the film. In the Lord Protector's society, a strict gender binary is enforced, with men performing the roles of soldier and hunter, and women being relegated to caretakers and housemaids. The men are meant to serve as the strong, patriarchal protectors of the people within the town. In actuality, they serve as an agent of authoritarian enforcement. Their destruction of the surrounding wilderness to expand the settlement also ties into this idea thematically, which I'll expand on a bit more in the next section. 
Meanwhile, the women are forced into domestic servitude, ordered to do the cooking, cleaning, and other essential maintenance. Additionally, these women are subjugated through the work is prayer mindset, another result of religious enforcement. Work is prayer, girl. Better if you don't stop. The striking visuals of the characters, separated and closed off from the other, emphasizes this binary that serves to confine each gender within a strict pretense of expectations, being both literally and metaphorically caged. The woodblock print art style of the town illustrates the idea of society as a cage, which I'll also expand upon more in a bit, but directors Tom Moore and Ross Stewart said in this interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Robin's home in Kilkenny is a cage, and the visuals reinforce that. The line work is very harsh and very black and white. There's high contrast and there's a lot of geometric patterning, kind of like a warped perspective. We also see literal cages come up when we see that the Lord Protector has Maeve's mother imprisoned and then later Maeve herself. Robin's house, the scullery, even the town itself often resemble a cage, a box of imprisonment that the societal gender expectations have put upon this character. But thankfully for Robin, the film shows us that there is another option besides simply tolerating the existence within the confines of social expectations. An option where instead she can be free from the imprisonment of the gender binary. That's where Maeve and the Wolfwalkers come in. As part of its commentary on colonialism, the film incorporates a strong message about humanity's relationship to nature and the devastating effects of imperial deforestation. But additionally, when looked at in diametric opposition to the strict social structure of the town that centers itself around the gender binary, the surrounding wilderness serves as a metaphor for freedom from this rigid and oppressive structure. Once again, this is shown through the visual style. Inspired by lino cut with a grid-like appearance, straight lines and angular shapes, cold and gray colors confined within the bounds of thick, bold lines to represent the rigidness of society. Meanwhile, the surrounding forest is warm and bright, fluid and moving, ever-growing and intertwining in a loose watercolor art style. In that earlier mentioned Hollywood Reporter interview, directors Tom Moore and Ross Stewart describe that to convey the freedom of the forest, we leaned into the very sketchy, rough pencil work and line work describing all the forms with lots of curves, lots of flowing lines. You get a sense that the entire environment is alive and very luxurious and lush, almost Rococo style. These soft and curving lines evoke the feeling of freedom that the natural world represents, freedom from the confines of social expectations. We can even see this in the character designs of Maeve and her mother, Mole, being comprised of round and soft shapes with wild and bushy hair, as opposed to the townspeople who are all blocky and angular, covered and proper. I'll definitely have more to say about hair when I talk about Robin, but we'll get there soon. So, you know, put a pin in it. It's also worth mentioning the actual mythology that the Wolfwalkers come from. As noted from the art of Wolfwalkers, one of the main inspirations for the film are the Man-Wolves of Ossery, who in some versions of their stories are able to leave behind their bodies while traveling as wolves, much like in the film. They were sometimes said to be the descendants of the old gods of Ireland, or the ancestor of the original kings of Ossery. The use of this myth adds yet another thematic layer to this metaphor, one that emphasizes a deep, cultural, and practically sacred connection to the natural world. Before the colonization of the town by the Lord Protector, the townspeople, well, mainly just Sean Og, have an understood sense of reverence for these roots, and a respect for the alternative ways of living, something that's easily disregarded by the English regime. What we need to keep in mind is that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that societal structures, specifically gender roles, were functionally different in ancient Celtic cultures. It's hard to find a lot of information about this time period for a number of reasons, partly because it's ancient history, partly because of erasure from colonialism, but here's what we need to understand. Gender and the roles and expectations within different genders was framed around a different social structure. The binary, patriarchal, heteronormative society as we see it in the film originates from a Puritan-guided conquest to oppress and control people, primarily women. And history aside, the film still confirms this on its own terms. Maeve actually calls out Robin's nonconformity to her expected role, questioning her aspirations of being a hunter despite being a girl. Hey, stop! That's me for hunting! Oh, ah, a hunter! Ha, a little girl like you! 
But when Robin points out that she's a girl too, Well, you're a girl too. I'm no girl. I'm a wolf walker. Ah! This is beyond crucial. In a manner of speaking, what Maeve is saying here is that she's functionally non-binary by the film's own language. Now, I don't want to get caught up in the semantics of gender nonconformity and whether we can canonically call this character non-binary, but what it does mean, without a shadow of a doubt, is that the status of Wolfwalker means gender nonconforming in this context. When characters are or become Wolfwalkers, there's thus this pervading sense that they're leaving their gender expectations behind in favor of a more freeing, flowing, and unfettered gender expression. When taking all of this into account, the sacred ancestral roots of the mythology, coupled with the contrasting visual style that evokes freedom, then the act of colonial deforestation takes on an additional layer of meaning. It serves as another means of oppression, literally burning down and erasing anything that could present itself as an alternative to serving your expected role, continuing to enforce the town's rigid social structure in ongoing benefit of the ruling class. Therefore, the Wolfwalkers, as a representation of indigenous Celtic culture, serve as an antithesis to the colonial gender binary. Wolfwalkers deftly explores the dynamics of these themes, primarily through the character arc of the story's protagonist herself, Robin. And I just want to say, Robin has one of the most compelling arcs that I've ever experienced from a protagonist, especially when relating to her as a non-binary person who has struggled with the expectations of my family and culture. Let's start at the beginning of the film. With an understanding of the hunter-housemaid binary that exists within this social structure, right away from this introductory scene, we see Robin as a character that inherently defies it by proxy of who she is. She ignores her domestic duties in favor of her preferred pastime, practicing shooting her crossbow. She has a clear affinity for the natural world, indicated by her best friend being a falcon, as well as her desire to be outdoors. Something noteworthy at the beginning point of this story, Robin misguidedly wants to be a wolf hunter for a couple of reasons. Not only is hunting wolves the established status quo for the society, but also within the frame of the binary, being a hunter is the closest available option that lines up with at least some of Robin's desires, which include being outside in the wilderness, getting to use her tactical skills, and most importantly, being with her family. But as the story continues, Robin gains a new perspective and discovers her true self-identity, which will have her rethinking her original desires. Her father, Bill Goodfellow, plays an important role as both a source of conflict for Robin and as a character that parallels her own arc, which I will get into more later, so put a pin in the board again. But in this opening scene, despite the clear love he has for his daughter, he ends up shutting her down and denying her freedom, all in the name of following the Lord Protector's rules. Oh, that's... Lord Protector has strict rules. No children beyond the walls, you know that. I mentioned earlier in the video that I related a lot to Robin as a non-binary person, and I'd like to incorporate a little bit of my own personal story into this analysis to highlight some of these parallels. When I was a kid, I would often be called a tomboy. I wasn't really into girly things, and I especially hated to wear dresses and skirts. Thankfully, my parents didn't really enforce this too much, and they were generally okay with it, giving me a pretty gender-neutral childhood. It wasn't until I was older and my queerness began to be more evident that I started getting pushback from the people around me. I'd get made fun of for not being able to perform femininity well, or otherwise made to feel ashamed for my self-expression or attraction to people. I found Robin's relationship with her father to be very relatable in this way. The people that I was surrounded by mostly just misunderstood me while trying to get me to be something I wasn't, more so than not accepting me. Slight tangent here for just a moment, but I want to acknowledge Robin's bird, Merlin. In the beginning, he's Robin's only friend, indicating to us that she's an outsider who's new in town, but additionally, her inherent affinity for the natural world, which, as we explored, has all these layers of meaning. But additionally, throughout the story, Merlin also often acts as Robin's superego, either a guiding conscience or a reflection of Robin's desires. When trying to shoot a wolf, Robin's arrow ends up accidentally hitting Merlin, indicating to us how, at this point of the story, Robin is working against her own self-interest, and against her own true self. Then later, when Merlin pulls Robin's arrow out of her crossbow, it's her conscience taking back control and forcing her to do what's right. More on Merlin later, but for now I want to shine a spotlight on another character, arguably the most endearing and adorable character in this film. Introducing Maeve. When I sleep, I'm a wolf. When I'm awake, I'm me, 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 oh, 
We learn the fundamentals of her character easily during her first interaction. When Robin initially sees her, she's a bit, well, standoffish. But when she doesn't have to be a defender and she feels safe, during her first encounter with Robin, she's curious and playful. As we discussed earlier, Maeve is established as an opposite to Robin in many ways. Remember that her wolf form implies several things. Sacred connections to nature, which embody freedom and defiance from the town's social norms. When Maeve accidentally bites Robin, the Wolfwalker mythology acts as an allegory for the sharing of a culture, an alternative foreign viewpoint for Robin, but one that by virtue of the story she's forced to consider. As Maeve and Robin play in the forest, Maeve literally and figuratively opens the door to show Robin that there can be a way of life outside of society's expectations. And as these two continue to develop feelings for one another, more on that later, Robin realizes that what she's learned about the wolves and the wolfwalkers was essentially a lie, and she becomes an ally to Maeve. Unfortunately, even just being an ally to the Wolfwalkers, the sheer mention of an alternative option to her father, and Robin is met with resistance and suppression, with her father once again citing the Lord Protector as the reason to follow orders. If we can just find a mother- Listen, you have to follow the Lord Protector's rules. He gave you a direct order and you disobeyed him. Have you no fear of the stocks? And Robin's father ends up being the oppressor himself as he takes her down to the scullery personally. The maids at the scullery cite both this Puritan idea of righteousness and established gender traditions to force Robin into an expected role, critical systemic forces when it comes to queer oppression. This experience reminded me a lot of my own struggles as I was coming to terms with my own queerness and testing the waters by talking about celebrities or people in my life around me. I definitely became an ally for my queer friends before realizing that I was actually queer myself. It's a common experience and it was definitely the case for me as well. I would say something in defense of my friends and be met with a negative reaction, noting in my mind not to express myself in the ways that they do. I spent many years, particularly through high school and early college, struggling to fit myself into what was traditionally expected of a young woman. The feeling of being forced to play a gender role that isn't for you, but is being thrust upon you, is not unlike the feeling we get from these scenes of Robin working in the scullery. Monotonous, drab, depressing, and pointless. No matter how supposedly righteous everyone tells you it's supposed to be, it just feels wrong in every way. In the next scene, Robin wakes up as a wolf for the first time, representing her transformation into her true self. Transformation has often been used as an allegorical device to convey aspects of queer narratives. The use of the animal transformation in Wolfwalkers is an allusion to Robin coming into her own self-identity. And as we've previously established, Wolfwalkers represent this non-binary, gender non-conforming identity that exists outside of conventional societal norms. So Robin wakes up as a wolf, her true self. However, her immediate reaction is fear once she's faced with her father who doesn't understand her and therefore endangering her. She's confronted then by the townspeople who all hate her based on the fear-mongering anti-wolf propaganda they've been fed and they end up chasing her out of town. When Robin finds Maeve in the woods, Maeve calms Robin down by telling her not to worry about what the townspeople think of her and instead tells her to learn how to be a wolf first. But the soldiers and, and my father. Don't worry about that. Learn how to be a wolf first. Come on. Furthering the allegory that becoming a wolf is a rejection of social expectations. And Robin's wolf vision literally and figuratively become her new perspective. In embracing her wolf form, Robin finds a new way of looking at and understanding the world around her, experiencing freedom granted with her new body. Additionally, the feeling of freedom and joy is underscored by the visual language and emotional music. Note the lyrical changes from the original song of Running with the Wolves to the movie version. The most brilliant use of visual storytelling in this film is how the animators use this sketchy, freeform style, most prominent in Wolf Vision, to further evoke this feeling of freedom while also representing the transformations taking place within Robin, and later Bill. During my own gender discovery journey, I felt a similar sense of freedom once I figured out what made me the most comfortable and surrounded myself with the people who would allow me to express myself freely. In college, while I was questioning my gender, I joined a trans support group, a space where I could present myself however I wanted without judgment, try out new pronouns or names to see what felt right, and expose myself to perspectives and potential options that I never would have considered as viable options for myself before. 
Robin's euphoria as a wolf reminds me of my own gender euphoria, when people used the right pronouns that felt right, or treated me as who I was instead of who I was expected to be. A community that embraces you regardless of what the ignorant society you come from thinks can be a life-saving and soul-affirming bedrock of anyone's journey of self-discovery. However, the journey of self-discovery is only the first step to the path of self-acceptance. Even though Robin realizes this is her true self, when she goes back into the town as a wolf, she is confronted with a society, and sadly a family, that seemingly hate her for who she is. When Robin gets back into her human body and tries to explain to her father and then the Lord Protector that the wolf walkers actually need to be protected, she's forcefully shut down. The Lord Protector claims that the wolf walkers are pagan nonsense, reminding us yet again that yes, this oppression is specifically Puritan flavored. <laughs> These next couple of scenes are particularly heartbreaking, evoking feelings of being stifled and repressed. Robin forcing herself to stay awake reminds me of the stress and paranoia that came with suppressing myself to make sure that no one saw my queerness for the sake of my own safety. While I was in this support group, I cautiously came out to a handful of people and slowly started presenting more masculinely for my own comfort, but I was still terrified if someone were to confront me. I still got confronted about it too, and that wasn't fun. <laughs> And when Robin performs her scullery work, we feel the dreadful, melancholic monotony of being forced into an expected gender role. She's literally framed by chains, the shackles of this binary, patriarchal society. The saddest part is, she's fully succumbed to this and accepted this as her place, giving up completely on hope. This is what it feels like to be trans or queer with an unsupportive family or community. This is why so many trans kids are depressed, anxious, or suicidal. The feelings of Robin folding to this oppressive system are exactly those that queer people feel when they've given up on being their authentic selves after being put down by a hateful society. I want to take a moment to circle back to two characters I mentioned previously, Merlin and Maeve. As we discussed, Merlin acts as an extension of Robin, and interestingly at this point in the story, Maeve does as well. Robin does try to set Merlin free, once again reflecting her own true desire that she's denying herself. In a way, there's a sense of Robin wanting to live vicariously through Merlin as she sets him free. However, once Maeve confronts Robin on this, Robin ends up trying to repress Maeve as well, literally and figuratively caging her which is in parallel to how Robin herself is being repressed. This is for your own good, man. This is for your own good. I'm sorry. Yes, but Maeve is an entity that literally cannot be contained. As we discussed earlier, Maeve's freeform visual language communicates that she's liberated from the confines of society, especially in contrast to the rigid style of the colonizers and the townsfolk. It's fitting, then, that any attempts to physically confine her as well also completely fail. And just as we think Robin will be confined within these imposing borders and the shrinking frame, she makes a stand and breaks out of them, both figuratively and visually, as we see the bounds of the screen expand. This is an incredibly brave action, as Robin defiantly blocks her father's arrow, standing up to the person she so desperately wanted approval from at the beginning of her journey. When Bill admits his fear to Robin that she'll end up in a cage, she responds that she already is in one, referring of course to the gender expectations that have been forced upon her. As hard as it is to defy her father, she frees Mole, knowing that this is the right thing to do. And in doing so, she frees herself from the expectations of a young girl, and she breaks out of the cage of the patriarchal society. All right, there's a subtle visual detail that I've skirted past, but now I've got to acknowledge it. Back to the board. Robin's hair acts as a visual metaphor that guides us along her journey of self-discovery. The politics of hair have always been prominent as a part of queer and anti-colonial movements within culture. Certain kinds of hair and hairstyles can be tied to specific cultures, and these have been used as pretexts for discrimination and oppression. But hair can also be used as an empowering vehicle of self-expression and radical rebellion. This visual metaphor is most obvious when comparing the women of the Puritan society in the town, who all cover their hair in traditional headdresses, to the bushy, unwieldy floof that is the wolfwalker's hair. Robin throughout the first part of the film has her hair neatly tied back in braids and covers her head with her hunter's hood, representing her state at the start of the film. Not quite completely repressed, but at least held back her hood representing a role that she's trying to fit into. 
Then, when Maeve introduces her to the forest, Robin takes off her hood, freeing her hair as well as experiencing a taste of freedom. Then, in the scenes where Robin is in conflict with her father, trying to express her true self but being suppressed by outside forces, Robin has a few unruly strands of hair that stick out while the rest of it is being forcibly covered, further emphasizing her struggle to reveal her true self despite the circumstances that are closeting her. And then when she finally stands up for herself and decides to cast aside the expectations that are forced upon her, despite the fear of losing her father, we see her take off her bonnet and completely unleash her hair as it literally breaks through the borders of the screen, signifying her own freedom from the confines of social expectations. Once Robin reconnects and reconciles with Maeve, she proclaims that she's not a townie anymore. I'm not a townie anymore, Maeve. Thanks for helping, Mama. <laughs> Fully accepting her non-binary identity, rejecting to participate in the town's social structure, and resisting the imprisonment of the patriarchy and gender roles. And Robin telling her father that she's now one of them and then exposing her wolf form is a powerful coming out metaphor. And that's not just me reading into it. In the interview with The Quietus, director Ross Stewart says, One of the most important parts of Robin's arc is her coming out moment when she decides that she has to tell her father that she's a wolf walker. For Ross, this marks Robin's decision to take her own choices, to live life for herself rather than her family. Robin fully comes into her own element as a wolf, being able to use her tactical ability to its fullest potential while protecting the forest from the Lord Protector's invasion. And as she returns to her human body, her hair flows dramatically, signaling her freedom. Her aim is precise, using the skill she had initially honed to hunt wolves to now protect them from their oppressor. There's a lot that could be pulled from the film that supports this non-binary reading of Robin when examining the themes of self-discovery through transformation and freedom from gendered social expectations through a queer lens. Additionally, there are aspects of Robin's character throughout the development of the film, mainly that she was originally conceived to be a boy, that lend itself to this queer reading of her character. In that Q&A with The Hollywood Reporter, director Tom Moore says, Yeah, it was an interesting journey. At the very beginning, Robin was going to be a little boy. We had to contrive obstacles for him to come up against. A little boy who wants to be a wolf hunter in that world. A little boy who was trying to establish himself in that world as outside of the... Um, the, the norm was also going to have less friction even if he would have had plenty than a little girl and in that world of kind of oppression and that kind of puritan worldview that saw women could only either be you know housemaids or or witches if they went against the grain so just the fact of her changing her gender made her have to be a much stronger character because what she was going up against the stakes were much higher you know and during a panel with the gina davis institute on gender in media on the topic of robin's gender Director Ross Stewart says, We're becoming aware that gender is quite fluid nowadays. Boys are more feminine and young girls sound more like boys. We didn't have to change much of Robin's conversation as it was applicable for either gender. Bill's transformation is integral to this scene as well. And you may have noticed that I've asked you to put a couple of pins in the board next to Bill's name. This is because Robin's father goes through his own gender non-conforming arc of self-discovery alongside his daughter. It may not have as many beats to it, but it doesn't have to, since it's moving in parallel with Robin's arc, as well as utilizing many of the same visual storytelling techniques. Thanks to this, we're able to infer much of Bill's character arc as it moves in tandem with Robin's. Bill's arc is about learning to be a parental figure to Robin that's outside of a traditional paternal role, particularly in the absence of Robin's mother, needing to take on a parental role outside of the traditional father-mother binary. There are a few ways that Bill's in-betweenness is demonstrated to us. First, his character is comprised of shapes conveyed with the same visual language as his daughter, with his form also primarily being shaped with both curved and angular lines. According to the Art of Wolfwalker's book, his original role was meant to be more antagonistic, reflected in his old design, which is much more angular and sinister. Another is through the key characteristics of Bill himself, which are actually quite similar to Robin. Although he's associated with the town through being a part of the Lord Protector's regime, he also spends most of his time in the wilderness and in tune with nature, which lends him to being an incredibly skilled hunter. From the beginning of the film, he's established as a kind and gentle caretaker who loves to spend quality time with his daughter, acting especially gender non-conforming for the role of a father. This gentleness is forcibly shifted into sternness and strict rules when Bill is in fear of the consequences from the system outside of his control. 
What I especially love about this movie is that despite Bill's mistakes, one thing that remains true throughout the entire film is his unwavering love for his daughter. And in fact, the power of love between a parent and a child is one of those thematic threads that ties this whole story together. But when social pressures begin to come down on him, his worst fears for his daughter end up oppressing her as well, continuing a vicious cycle. In the first scene where Robin tries to tell Bill about the Wolfwalkers, he ends up shutting her down. These intense moments with Bill are underscored by these harsh graphite shadows, further illustrating his own internal conflict. Robin retorts back that, Mother would have listened to me. Establishing the gendered aspect of Bill's internal struggle, as well as setting him up to parallel the maternal figure of Mole later on in the film. The scene on stage in front of the town marks a low point for Bill's character, reduced to a foot soldier and following orders from the Lord Protector to keep Mole in control. As he fumbles attempting to capture Maeve as the town laughs at him, Robin pleads for him to stop, crying out to him. This scene parallels the scene where Robin accidentally shot Merlin, which was also a point where she was working against her own best interests. And both of these scenes set up the character to be in a position to learn about a new perspective, done through Wolfbite. A breakthrough moment happens for Bill when Robin's bravery finally compels him to admit that he's afraid, for himself, but especially for his daughter. He already lost his wife, and Robin is all he has left, the same way that Maeve and Merlin are now all that Robin has. Admitting his fear is the first step to broadening his worldview, but without the attempt to understand his daughter and why her motivations are what they are, he still clings on to this fear and lashes out, shooting an arrow that takes down Mole just as Maeve had reunited with her mother. Something that's true for a lot of parents of queer children is that oftentimes they can more or less be okay with who their kid is, but they act out of fear of the queerphobic society that they know their child will have to grow up in. And without trying to understand where their kid is coming from, it can often lead to these kinds of confrontations. In that earlier mentioned Hollywood Reporter interview, Tom Moore says about Bill and Robin's relationship, Ultimately, if you think about it, the dad has the longest, biggest arc in the movie. Robin is a young person and quite ready for change and wants change. So she kind of completes her arc very quickly. And then the story becomes about her trying to bring dad to the other side. And it actually takes her giving up on him and realizing that he'll never let her go physically. And she has to kind of leave her body behind. And he can't accept what she is, even when she tells it to his face. So she kind of comes out of her body, as we said. It has a certain analogy for lots of different things that you come up against when you're finding your own identity. I can say for myself, after I came out, I've definitely been hurt by people close to me who have either tried to fix me or change me back to how I was before without understanding why I was transitioning. And it wasn't until I gained my independence and had the ability to leave these people behind that they finally realized that they had to change. Bill's transformation into a wolf to protect Robin represents his own transition into his non-binary identity by paralleling two characters with similar scenes before him. This parallels Robin's transformation, with Bill literally and figuratively breaking free from the shackles of the gender roles forced upon him. It also parallels Mole's protection of Maeve, fulfilling a maternal role by echoing Mole's actions from earlier in the film. Notice the parallels both visually and thematically, with both parents attempting to break away from their constraints, intercut with their child in imminent danger, before they break away from their chains that confine them with the power of the wolf form. The wolf form, again, represents a non-binary identity outside of the traditional expectations of society, breaking the shackles of gender expectations just like his daughter. One of my favorite moments in the film that also always makes me weep is the gentle look that Robin gives to her father, still in wolf form, as the wolf pack tries to heal Mole. He's hesitant at first, ashamed for the mistakes he's made, but Robin's look of encouragement and forgiveness is a powerful moment of love. And when Mole and Robin accept him and say that he's one of them, that love and acceptance grants Bill, alongside Robin, the freedom to leave behind the society that was shackling them both. With Mole singing in the background, the song bookends Robin's journey from the beginning of the film with the lyrics changed from Wolf, Wolf, Kill the Wolf, Hunt Them Far and Yonder, to Wolf, Wolf, How's the Wolf, 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 Run Free. No one in this pack has to be a hunter or a housemaid, and they can live happily in peace in a community that accepts Robin's queer identity. And lastly, it would be remiss of me not to say that I absolutely think that these two are destined for one another. To me, the nature of their relationship is explicitly queer-coded. I'd like to circle back to that Den of Geek article that inspired me to make this video. Quote, 
Robin and Maeve bicker and fight at first, but soon become fast friends, as is cliche in such storylines. But there's more. The two clasp hands and gaze into each other's eyes, deeply. The personal space between them is close and, at moments, more intimate than you might expect. The two roll about in the grass, laughing and playing. Wolfwalkers ends with Robin, Maeve, and their respective parents heading off to an unknown place, collectively and happily together. In the wagon, Robin and Maeve are notably lying together in bed, their faces extremely close together. Personal space is all but gone. They are not close friends or pseudo-stepsisters. They are lovers, fully in tune and comfortable with their queer sides, no longer trapped in the town that is laid out and walled off like a prison. This film plays its queer themes so hard that they're practically text, and it makes a deeper, richer, more socially relevant and honest film. I believe the uh, subtext here is, is rapidly becoming uh, <coughs> a text. And I mean, come on. Their heads literally make a freaking heart. Are you gonna watch that and look me in the eyes and tell me that these two are, what, just two girl best friends? Gals being pals? What some historians might call roommates? I don't care what anyone has to say, if all of y'all can say that the kids from Ponyo are soulmates, then I can absolutely say that Robin and Maeve are soulmates, or even better, packmates. And, you know, it doesn't hurt that Ross Stewart also said this on Twitter, that Robin, Bill, Maeve, and Mole are essentially now a pack, ambiguous and open to any interpretation. And that Mole and Bill aren't a couple, just two single parents which doesn't stop Maeve and Robin from living life whatever way they want. But that's just my own interpretation of the story, and I would love to hear your thoughts. What did you think of Wolfwalkers? Did you relate to any of the characters? And if you could turn into any animal, what would it be? I think for me, every time I go to sleep, I'd wake up as a corgi. Leave a comment down below and let me know. Also, I usually mention at the end of my videos that if you'd like to go the extra mile to support me, I have a Patreon, which I still do, but I also wanted to let y'all know that I've also opened up a Ko-fi and you can also become a member of my YouTube channel right here by clicking that join button down below. I'll actually start to post updates and exclusive stuff for supporters, as well as grant early access to new videos. I would super appreciate any amount you can give wherever you feel like donating for however long. This video was really a labor of love, but also it was a lot of labor. You also might have noticed that the editing is a lot more slick, and that's because I hired Tom to help me out with it. He also helped me out a ton with the script, so a huge, huge, huge thank you to him for everything. This video was essentially a collab, and it wouldn't exist without him. I'm basically paying him out of pocket, seeing as I made less than five bucks on YouTube over the past month, so if you liked this video and feel moved to do so, please consider becoming a supporter wherever it's most convenient for you. All of the links will be down in the description. If you can't afford it but still want to show your support, I would really appreciate you leaving a like and a comment on the video and sharing it with your friends or on your social media channels. You can also subscribe for more in the future or follow me elsewhere to stay up to date on what the heck I'm doing. Again, links in the description. Thank you so much for watching. I love you and appreciate you. Stay safe and till next time. Ow!